CBC News has obtained a letter revealing more pressure on the Prime Minister to repatriate Canadians detained in Syria. 26 of the 47 Canadians detained there are children. The adults all have suspected ties to ISIS. A letter was sent to Justin Trudeau back in January urging him to bring them home. It was signed by 10 human rights groups and advocates in this country and it echoes a report out this week from the U.S.-based Human Rights Watch which accuses this country of abandoning its citizens and flouting international human rights obligations. Here was the Prime Minister's response earlier today to that report. We recognize that uh, we need to try and help all Canadians. Uh, it is more complicated when we talk about uh, the fact that a number of these piece of people could face charges uh, when they return to Canada for uh, uh, their activities linked to terrorism. Uh, but uh, the engagement that we need to have with people around the world uh, in order to make sure that they're getting uh, the support uh, that they, they have a right to as Canadians uh, continues to be something we worry about. So just how complicated or dangerous would repatriating those Canadian citizens be? Jessica Davis is a former strategic analyst with CSIS. She's now president of Inside Threat Intelligence. Leah West is a former national security lawyer in the Department of Justice. She's now a lecturer of national security and intelligence at Carleton University's Norman Patterson School of International Affairs. Both join me from Ottawa. Hello. Great to see you both. As well. uh, Leah, I'm going to start with you and I want to start on that letter uh, obtained by uh, my colleague Brennan McDonald. It says that, the Can that Canadian children and adults currently detained in Syria are experiencing ongoing and serious human rights violations. The signatories are obviously calling on the feds and I want to read exactly what it says to take all reasonable steps to provide those individuals with protection from these violations, including repatriating the children and providing travel documents and support to those adults who want to return to Canada. Leah, what do we know about why, uh, first of all, those people, those adults are in Syria? And, and second, what kinds of conditions they are facing? So uh, from what we know of the adults, and some of them I, I personally spoke to last year in Syria, uh, traveled overseas to either join or support ISIS or live inside the caliphate um, in years uh, leading up to uh, 2018 when the caliphate really um, came crumbled in terms of holding ground in Syria. And those individuals that were um, left on the ground um, as uh, Baghouz, the last kind of stronghold of Syria, uh, fell, um, were ultimately detained um, by either the United States and then turned over to Kurdish authorities or Kurdish authorities. And they remain in custody inside uh, northeastern Syria um, under the uh, autonomous administration of northeastern Syria. Um, they've been detained. They have not been prosecuted. They have not been charged. Um, the men are in uh, typically in makeshift prisons across the region, while most of the women um, and all of the children are in um, camps living in really, truly deplorable conditions. Jess, let me ask you about uh, what the federal government can slash should do, because that's the substance of this report and then this letter as well. And we heard the prime minister, he was actually asked a few times today about this. Uh, we, the three of us, have talked about this subject before, and I would say today his, his argument against doing so was largely predicated on the logistics of it. So we don't have consular services there. Uh, it's too dangerous, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's too dangerous to send uh, people who aren't set up there, no diplomatic presence, in to, to go get them. Therefore, logistically, it's not really something that we can pull off. What do you make of that argument? It's a very political argument, frankly, because what we know is that at least 25 states around the world have active repatriation policies for their citizens. This includes countries like China and Russia, as well as other countries like Albania and Ireland. So they're able to get consular services to their citizens. I find it difficult to believe that Canada doesn't have the same capabilities that a lot of these countries do. So what it really comes down to at this point is a political decision by the government to not make those services available, in my opinion. Um, what that means, is, and I understand this from the government's perspective, that it's uh, a bit of a nightmare politically to be contemplating uh, a policy of, of controlled repatriation for these individuals. But I think the alternative is far, far worse. So these individuals are being held in detention facilities, but they do escape with a somewhat regular frequency. The possibility exists, and I would say that this possibility is um, quite a, a stark one, that people could, Canadians could escape from these camps and commit terrorist attacks 
or other sort of forms of terrorism elsewhere. And to me, the political repercussions of that, both internationally and domestically, are far worse than implementing a policy of controlled return. What I found so interesting from the prime minister's remarks today, Leah, and, and again, based on the, you know, we've talked about this before when we used to interview Ralph Goodell a lot on the show, who was at the time minister of public safety. I found it interesting that the prime minister led today with logistics because in the past, Minister Goodell has led with a more political argument, which is you chose to go over there and fight with ISIS. Sorry, this is, and, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but sorry, this is what basically you're going to face. Like, it, it's not our obligation to bring you back if that's what you went over there to do. And the prime minister wasn't really saying that today. What did you make of that, Leah? I think because that argument doesn't work for the 26 children. Right. The 26 children who are in those camps had no choice in the matter. Some of them were born there and they've known nothing else. They're just as much victims there as anyone else um, who suffered at the hands of ISIS, including some of the Canadians who are now detained abroad. So the only argument left when you're talking about children is logistics. And again, as Jessica pointed out very well, 20 other countries... Um, Kosovo, for example, repatriated 500 people, have been able to make the logistics work. And I'll just say, while we don't have consular services in that particular region, only about a three and a half hour drive away in Herbal, we do. So it's not as if there's this great expanse between where we actually have Canadian officials who could provide these services and where the Canadians are currently detained. Speaking more to, as well, the political argument uh, Jessica, is, I mean, like we publish a story about this or we talk about it and the feedback we get, I get, is almost uniformly against this idea, right? And I understand the legal argument being put forth. I, I understand the humanitarian angle being put forth, especially where those kids are concerned. But I think for a lot of people, it's still pretty fresh in their memory when we were living through all of this, especially, you know, the worry of a, an attack here in Canada, that these people left this country to uh, align themselves with a terrorist organization. And so I'm wondering, Jessica, what you think of, of the, those kinds of considerations, I guess, where the government is concerned. Yeah, there's a couple of things there. So I think, first of all, it's really important to point out that Canada has been called upon to repatriate its citizens by the United Nations, by our closest ally, the United States, and by the Syrian Democratic Forces themselves. So there's a lot of international pressure on Canada to do this. I understand that a lot of Canadians have a lot of reluctance in terms of the idea of bringing suspected terrorists back into this country. But I think part of what I hear as well is this idea that they just come back and would be sort of walking around the streets of Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, you know, cities and, and, and towns in this country. But that's not really how it works. So what would actually end up happening is that each of these individuals, were they, be, were they to be brought back to Canada, would undergo an individual threat assessment. So we would have our law enforcement and security services would undertake a robust assessment about their intent and capabilities in terms of future activity, let alone investigations potentially into their, their criminal activity. And we have tools at our disposal, like things like peace bonds to restrict their ability to move and ability to undertake particular activities. And most of these individuals would be would undergo at least a few months, if not years, of surveillance and assessment about their, to make sure and to help mitigate any potential terrorist activity that they were planning, if that were the case. And so the idea that, and one of the things that I find so difficult here is that the idea here is that the Canadian government is basically saying that a non-state actor, the Syrian Democratic Forces, um, are in a better position to mitigate the threat that these Canadians pose than our domestic law enforcement and security services are. And to me, this doesn't tell me that the, that the government has a lot of confidence in our domestic institutions. That's a really interesting point. I'm not sure if I had framed it that way in my head, because I, I feel like, again, when we had then Minister Goodale on, he would, I think, fairly make the point, Leah, and I'd love your response to it, and I'm not sure if, the, if you know, Minister Blair would make the same one, that it, it, it's a difficult crime to prosecute in this country, right? That, it, you know, resources, I take your point on the, the surveillance, but we've done many stories about how resources are already stretched, and then the idea of, A, having enough evidence, meeting the evidentiary bar to charge and then possibly convict is not sort of an easy bar to, bar to meet. Leah, what do you think about that? I think in some cases that may be true, but the sheer traveling abroad to participate and support terrorist activity is a crime. They're there. We know they went. 
We have evidence of that. <laughs> they've said it. They've talked to Human Rights Watch. They've talked to me and other reporters who have traveled abroad. They have talked to friends. They have talked to family. They have uh, communications records. That in and of itself may not be everything. We may not be able to hold them accountable for every crime um, that they committed um, while supporting ISIS, but I, I'm fairly confident in our public prosecution service and their ability to prosecute uh, a number of the adults for that offense. Um, so again, I, I know intelligence to evidence, which is you know a term often used for this, is really challenging, especially um, for some of the gravest human rights uh, violations that ISIS perpetrated. But I really don't uh, see this as a major hurdle to um, at least putting Canadians on trial for the crimes we know that they committed and that we have evidence that they have committed. The alternative, again, as Jessica said, is leaving them in the hands of the very people that they went over to victimize. And Canada should be better than that. Uh, Jessica, before I let you guys go, I just have time for one more question. Is there any way to uh, approach it uh, almost in separate ways, like the, the children and, and the adults? Like, is there a way for them to focus their energy on repatriating those kids uh, and then turn their attention you know, to the adults or use this argument where the adults are concerned? Because I, I do feel like for a lot of people, there's a big difference between the, those kids who, as Leah points out, you know, didn't ask for any of this. Yeah, a lot of countries around the world are implementing different policies in terms of repatriation. Some are repatriating just the children, some are repatriating women and children, and then some are doing it a bit more piecemeal in the sense that they're looking at individuals that they can prosecute for crimes and then bringing them back. And I just want to point to a German trial that's ongoing right now of a woman suspected of being a member of the Islamic State. She's currently on trial for war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, that kind of thing, um, for keeping a Yazidi woman as a slave and ultimately participating in her death. So there are ways to do this kind of thing, and Canada just, just needs to start looking at the international examples that are being set to make it happen. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you, both of you. Great to have you back on the program. and. Uh, such a wealth of information as usual. Thanks to Jessica Davis. She's a former strategic analyst with CSIS and Leah West, former national security lawyer in the Department of Justice. Great to see you both. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.